a version of it available to uh, available on the Hive website in usually a day or two after after the talk. Um, without with all of the logistics behind us, I am just so delighted to be able to introduce our trio of speakers today, um, all of whom are passionately engaged in using the tools of narrative medicine in both clinical practice and pedagogy to advance social justice. So first, Dr. Um, Sayantani Dasgupta is, I would argue, a paragon of interdisciplinary work. Um, her academic work combines speculative fiction, race, health, narrative, and social justice. Originally trained in pediatrics and public health, she's a senior lecturer in the discipline of narrative medicine at Columbia University. And here you'll start to see the interdis or hear the interdisciplinarity where she also teaches in the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. If you are at all steeped in health humanities research or teaching, you'll like, you will have likely come across Dr. Dasgupta's work on narrative humility, which advocates for storied ways of knowing as a tool for more just medicine. She's co-authored a number of, or co-authored or edited a number of academic texts, most recently, including the principles and practices of narrative medicine, which came out of Oxford UP in 2016. She has also written a best New York Times bestselling series of children's fantasy books. So truly um, a woman of many talents. Likewise, Yoshiko Iwai takes an interdisciplinary and narrative medicine approach to medical education and on oncologic care for individuals in the criminal justice system. A graduate of the Columbia University's program in narrative medicine and creative nonfiction. She's a first year medical student here at UNC who is already building coalitions across departments and schools after being here for just a few months. Finally, Zara Khan combines health humanities, social justice, and disruptive pedagogy in her research, writing, and community engagement, which includes a zine about liberation, third world feminism, and home called The Life Jacket. She teaches in the graduate program of narrative medicine at Columbia and uh, where she also serves as the co-chair of the university seminar on narrative health and social justice. So truly an um, just talented group of, of women with us today. Together, they've recently published a perspectives piece in The Lancet that like this talk posits abolition medicine as a project that can benefit from the tools of narrative medicine to as they put it, interrogate the upstream structures that enable downstream violence, like police brutality, and reimagine the world of medicine altogether as an anti-racist practice. We at Hive and many of our students are just so eager to um, do this kind of social or socially just narrative work and learn from our speakers. So please join me in welcoming them to Health Humanities Grand Rounds. Uh, thank you so much. We'll just uh, take a moment to share screen and get our sharing in order. Here we go. Um, all right. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yes. That looks great. All right. So uh, thank you so much uh, for having us. And um, I will turn it over to Yoshiko, who will start for us. Thank you, um, Hi, for having us. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Weed, for the very generous introductions. Um, and thank you all in the audience for joining our talk today on abolition medicine, reimagining the role of social justice in healthcare. There is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. There is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. There is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. Octavia Butler. The COVID-19 pandemic has pushed medicine and indeed all of humanity into a moment of crisis. But in that crisis is an opportunity an opportunity to see things anew, leave behind old practices that do not serve us and radically reimagine our futures. As novelist Ernst de Roy said last year 
in an article entitled, The Pandemic is a Portal. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Racist violence is a public health crisis. We can choose to carry it through to the other side of this pandemic portal, or we can leave it behind, reimagining a new world on the other side. It is on this premise that we're so honored to be here today, sharing our work on abolition medicine and engaging in a conversation about what work we in medicine and the health professions might do to build together an anti-racist future. We begin with a quote by the great science fiction novelist, Octavia Butler, because to talk about abolition medicine is inherently an act of speculation. It's an act of imagination about an anti-racist tomorrow. A tomorrow that's not here yet, but that is possible to both envision and work toward. My name is Yoshiko Iwai, and I'm a first year medical student at UNC School of Medicine. Um, as Dr. Weed said, prior to moving to Chapel Hill last summer, um, I was in New York City at Columbia, where I received my master's in narrative medicine and creative nonfiction writing. Um, my research and academic interests include medical education, carceral health, and cancer care. And it was in New York where um, I was very fortunate to meet Zara and Sayantani. Hi, all. my name is Zara Khan, um, and like Dr. Weed mentioned, um, I teach in the graduate program in narrative medicine at Columbia, where I too received my master's. Um, I currently co-chair the university seminar on narrative health and social justice, and I'm a co-editor and co-founder of The Life Jacket, a zine about intersectional feminism, community, and liberation. And I'm Sayantani Dasgupta. And as you heard from Dr. Reed's generous introduction, my original training was in public health and pediatrics, but I've been working in the field of health humanities for almost 20 years now. I'm a faculty member in the graduate program uh, at Narrative Medicine in Narrative Medicine at Columbia University. Uh, it's a program I also helped co-found. And as you heard, I also teach in the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, which has a new medicine, literature, and society major, or medical humanities major. Uh, my academic work tends to be at the interstices of story, race, justice, and speculation. Before we get to the heart of our presentation, we thought we would answer the question I'm sure many of you have, what is narrative medicine? In short, it is the scholarly and academic endeavor to, to honor the role of story in the healthcare encounter. If we agree that the ability to elicit, attend, and engage with narratives of illness and disability are integral to healthcare, narrative medicine seeks to train students and providers with these critical skills. Narrative medicine and the broader health humanities is committed to honoring the stories shared between providers and patients, as well as understanding the structural narratives that contextualize experiences of health and illness. Narrative medicine teaches us that stories matter, particularly at moments of crisis, trauma, and upheaval. Language affects the way that policies, actions, and attitudes are shaped towards justice or injustice. Who tells a story? Whose voice is heard and who's silenced? Who is framed as heroic and who villainous? All of these questions drive socially just narrative work. We began working on a collective essay in spring of 2020 when narratives around healthcare heroes were becoming a central part of our public consciousness. In particular, we were disturbed by the militaristic nature of some of the healthcare heroes' stories because, of course, doctors and nurses are not soldiers, antibiotics are not bombs, hospitals are not the front lines, hardworking medical trainees are not gunners, and neither disease nor patients are the enemy. 
Militarized language valorizes aggression and violence in medical training and the clinical encounter while confounding the loyalties of healthcare workers who serve and protect individuals and communities in need. The dangers of military metaphors in medicine were most famously described by Susan Sontag in her book, Illness as Metaphor, but they continue to dominate professional and lay imaginings of healthcare. Doctors and nurses are not soldiers. And yet in the late spring of 2020, even as US deaths from COVID-19 skyrocketed, the US military continued to conduct flyovers above multiple cities to honor what were dubbed America's healthcare heroes. These expensive gestures were taking place at the same time that healthcare workers were fighting for adequate personal protective equipment. Even as the country gathered nightly to clap for healthcare heroes, lives were lost on the front lines and among the marginalized communities more profoundly impacted by COVID-19. Militaristic language frames illness and deaths as inevitable plot lines rather than preventable occurrences. The hero's journey or the monomyth exists in narratology as a template in which the hero answers a call to adventure and they often encounter supernatural aid, challenges, defeats, and transformation before returning home. Personal sacrifice is necessarily folded into this narrative archetype. And while some degree of occupational risk is justified during the pandemic by the AMA Code of Ethics and the Hippocratic Oath, the scope of that sacrifice becomes a little bit difficult to discern. These militaristic metaphors also reinforce xenophobic nationalism, narratively pitting American heroes against foreign enemies. In the aftermath of 9-11, the cultural need for hero heroic figures raised emergency personnel like firefighters to the status of heroes in ways that mirror healthcare workers during COVID-19. President Bush's use of military rhetoric to create an American identity centered on the war on terror is reminiscent of President Trump's policies like the border wall, the Muslim ban and COVID-19 regulations, all of which weaponize xenophobia in the name of patriotism. The narrative of healthcare heroes reinforces tropes of, uh, of villainous external threats that encroach on the American body politic, even as a very real virus threatens the bodies of US citizens. Consider, for instance, the rise in anti-Asian violence and its connection to rhetorical racisms, including the China virus. Physicians are also implicated in this trope. There are numerous instances in the last year of Asian American physicians or healthcare heroes facing racist comments from patients, including refusal of treatment. These are a few clips that we uh, gathered together from a video created by Dr. Zhu, an, ophthalmolo uh, an ophthalmologist in Roland Heights, California, and a group of her Asian American colleagues who all got together and uh, made this video as a way of challenging anti-Asian sentiment. Among these images, one notable quote, which you'll see in the um, center image on the slide is, but I'm on the front lines risking my life to save yours. Then early last summer, uprising er uprisings erupted across the US in response to a different public health crisis that of structural and institutional racism. As healthcare workers took to the streets to support their communities, some parts of the state moved from lionizing its health personnel to injuring or arresting them along with protesters, even destroying their medical tents. Police SWAT teams swooped down on many US cities and the difference between real and metaphorical soldiers became startlingly clear. The militarized police and National Guard resembled an army, while healthcare workers were stuck with persisting shortages of PPE and, in our view, a meaningless metaphor of heroism. At this time, the intersections between public health and policing shifted to the center of national discourse. Suddenly, conversations about policing and police abolition were everywhere. It was at this particular time that we three practitioners of narrative medicine shifted our focus and began thinking of the connection or lack of connection between some of the militaristic healthcare heroes narratives and the real responsibilities of medicine. We began thinking about the intersection of medicine and abolition. And it was at this point that we wrote and ultimately published an article in The Lancet called Abolition Medicine. 
The question we began with was a simple one. Who do you serve? Who do you protect? We borrowed this question from a 2016 collection on policing, and yet it felt like it was a question with particular relevance to medicine. This, of course, isn't a new question in our fields. It's been asked before. American medicine was, after all, founded on a disturbing history of racist practices. Consider the invention of the pelvic speculum by Dr. J. Marion Sims, who has been called the father of modern gynecology. When I was in medical school, certainly, and I don't know if this is still the case now, decades later, I was never told the history of this important invention, nor the way that Dr. Sims used his new speculum to develop surgeries for vesicovaginal fistulas. I didn't know, nor was I ever told, that these surgeries were conducted unanesthetized on enslaved women, most of whose names history has forgotten, except those of Betsy, Anarka, and Lucy. Not only did these women endure dozens of painful surgeries, but they often served as assistants to these procedures, forced to hold each other down. Sims also apparently invited medical and other spectators to view his procedures. Needless to say, consent was not an issue on the, as it were, table in these situations. It wasn't until some students from my own institution, Columbia, protested a statue of Sims, which was up near Riverside Park, that this statue in New York City came down in 2017. Other statues of Sims remain in the country, including in South Carolina. Who do we serve? Who do we protect? We could fill the entirety of our talk with other examples of medical racism. We could speak about, for instance, the infamous Tuskegee syphilis experiments conducted from 1932 to 1972, during which African-American men in Alabama were denied access to treatment in a study that was designed to observe the natural history of untreated syphilis. We could speak about the support of eugenic ideals within medicine and by American practitioners, including the North Carolina Eugenics Board, who encouraged the reproduction of desirables, people with desirable traits, and supported a decrease in reproduction by undesirables. We could speak about the ubiquitous Fitter Families Contest, which happened all across the US, where during a state fair, while you showed off your prize-winning pumpkin or your livestock, you could also compete for the fittest, meaning white, able-bodied family. If this sounds familiar, you may be recognizing it from Nazi Germany, who drew inspiration for its concentration camps, uh, who drew inspiration for its concentration camps from eugenics movements in the US and the UK, not the other way around. We can look at how, in the name of these eugenic ideals, physicians conducted the forced sterilizations of people like Carrie Buck, who was perceived to be disabled or feeble-minded, and activist Fannie Lou Hamer, who was sterilized without her knowledge, without her consent, in a procedure that was so common, Fannie Lou Hamer famously called it the Mississippi appendectomy. The list continues with the forced sterilizations of indigenous women by the Indian Health Services in the 1960s, and Latina women in California through the 1970s. And of course, we would be remiss if we did not point to the way that this practice is still continuing today inside US prisons, group homes, and detention centers. So who do we serve? Who do we protect? How do we make sense of a 2016 study that showed that medical students think that black patients feel less pain than white patients? This finding can be traced to cruel, self-serving theories that justified the corporal punishment of enslaved black people by suggesting that black people had thicker skin and therefore could tolerate harsher physical conditions and pain better than white people. And this is related to current day evidence that physicians undertreat black patients' pain. How is that study, the Hoffman study, in turn related to the epidemic of black maternal mortality that we see in this country? The connection between all of these points is institutional racism. So who do we serve? Who do we protect? 
If we want a safer and more equitable system of public health, we must reckon with our healthcare system's history of racist practices. Contending with that violence and working to resist hundreds of years of oppression is part of our work. And we in medicine have been struggling to do abolition medicine work, whether or not we've been calling it that. For example, in fall of 2014, medical students across the US staged die-ins as part of a wave of nationwide Black Lives Matter protests. The intention was to create a shocking visual spectacle laying on the line white coats for black lives. The images were all over social media, students of all colors dressed in white coats, lying prone against eerily clean tile floors. One prone student held a sign reading, racism is real. These medical students collective protest not only created visual spectacle as you can see in this photo, but produced a dynamic speculative fiction. What would it mean if instead of Michael Brown or Eric Garner, or Freddie, Freddie Gray, these other more seemingly elite bodies were subjected to police violence. In another viral image, a group of African-American male medical students from Harvard posed wearing hoodies beneath their white coats, making clear that the bodies of some future doctors could perhaps be more easily targeted by state-sanctioned violence. They tried to bury us, read a sign held by one of the students. They didn't realize we were seeds. Similarly, in 2018, after the publication of the American College of Physicians position paper on the country's epidemic of gun violence, the National Rifle Association tweeted that anti-gun doctors should stay in their lane, which incited the This Is My Lane movement by US physicians, another narrative-based action. Here too, doctors relied on the spectacle of visual storytelling, posting images of their bloodied scrubs and shoes and the exhaustion of their post-shift faces as they described the horrors of treating victims of gun violence. These physicians and physicians in training told painful stories and created arresting visual ones, not only to make clear who they serve and protect, but also to impact concrete changes in policy, legislation, and governmental funding. Who do we serve? Who do we protect? In 2020, many healthcare heroes again knelt in solidarity with protesters and delivered care to those injured by rubber bullets, tear gas, and police violence, as they called out the names of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. In narrative medicine and the health humanities, we often turn to structural competency, a term coined by doctors Jonathan Metzl and Helena Hansen, which suggests that medical trainees need to be taught to recognize upstream causes such as food deserts and housing and insecurities of downstream health consequences like heart disease and diabetes. What has become clear for us is that police violence is the upstream cause of this downstream pain, death and disproportionate suffering. Police brutality is a public health emergency. As healthcare workers, there's a need to imagine new possibilities for public safety that emerge from public health as opposed to endangering it. We must tell new stories about medicine, community, and care. One way these new stories can be told is through the priorities of our healthcare organizations. In a 2018 statement, the American Public Health Association put out a policy statement called Policing Harms Public Health in which they stated the following. While public safety is essential for public health, as a society, we have delegated this important function almost exclusively to law enforcement. Evidence of continued law enforcement violence shows that US policing has failed to equitably deliver safety, placing an inequitable burden of mental and physical harm on socially and economically marginalized populations. This group went on to say, policing is a public health issue and encourage the public health community to shift away from reformist measures and toward structural root level changes to the harms that policing and by extension prisons cause to the health of our communities. So what we're contending today is not just that medicine must deal with the downstream effects of upstream policing and carceral systems, but that medicine can and must have a role in imagining and creating new visions of prevention itself. Consider, for example, the framing of community safety offered by Minneapolis City Councilperson Philippe Cunningham 
during a June 2020 virtual town hall hosted by President Barack Obama on policing and racism. In Cunningham's words, over-policing, criminalization, and mass incarceration have not kept our communities safer. In fact, people getting caught in the criminal justice system further disenfranchises black and brown folks, pushing us more to the margins of society. Our system's obviously broken. It's time for a new system of public safety. What does it mean to keep our communities safe? We have a paradigm for that. It's the public health approach to public safety. Cunningham goes on and talks about violence as a contagious disease that spreads interpersonally and intergenerationally. And he gives us a preventative framing. In other words, he says it is not enough to recognize that racist violence or police violence is a public health crisis, which it is. We must also act ourselves ask ourselves what we in medicine can do to prevent it from occurring. There can be no apolitical humanitarian approach to police brutality. The violence that is and has been happening across the US is being caused by an institution with concrete funding sources, the police. It is not an ethical or humanitarian act to patch up people who are being torn apart by guns without doing something about the availability of those guns. Similarly, it's not an ethical or humanitarian act to continue patching up communities who are being murdered by police brutality without doing something about the police state itself. Past attempts at US police reform, whether body cameras or increased anti-bias training haven't been enough to prevent racist police brutality or the deaths caused by it. We believe we must serve and protect the communities we care for by working toward alternative systems of community care, which brings us to abolition medicine. Okay, so what is abolition medicine? Abolition medicine invokes W.E.B. Du Bois' 1935 notion of abolition democracy, a vision based not only on breaking systems down, but necessitates building up a new, healthier, and more just society. Abolition has been pushed forward and expanded by activist scholars like Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and Mariam Kaba, all of whom have argued that the abolition of slavery was but one step in an ongoing process of abolitionist practices to address racialized systems of policing, surveillance, and incarceration. What's become clear to us is that our nation's network of profit-producing corporations that supply services of health and safety are all intrinsically connected. The military-industrial complex is tied to the prison-industrial complex, which is tied to the medical-industrial complex, all through mechanisms of policing. Therefore, if abolition is the resisting and generative framework to the prison industrial complex that envisions new strategies of addressing harm without reproducing oppression, then our contention is that abolition medicine is the organizing tool and response to the harms that are being reproduced by the medical industrial complex. So the essential work of abolition medicine is to interrogate upstream structures that enable downstream violence like police brutality in addition to reimagining the work of medicine altogether as an anti-racist practice. So the question, who do you serve, who do you protect, now takes on a whole new meaning when we place it in the context of abolition medicine. What then does abolition medicine look like? Well, just as examples of policing and violence stretch back years, so too do histories of mobilizing resistance, mutual aid, and collective care networks that exist independently of formalized institutional structures. We see this lineage of community care and health activism in the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program, which aimed to feed thousands of children across the country through mutual aid for each other. And we also see it in their national sickle cell screening program. Theirs was a public health effort created to meet the health needs of the community. And it falls on the same spectrum of public health approaches to public safety that we see the Young Lords implement in the 1970s. 
They were a Puerto Rican liberation organization that protested and successfully organized an inpatient treatment program for opioid use disorders with Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx. And they provided additional supportive measures with acupuncture. It's also in line with the same efforts we see today in Oakland by um, the Anti-Police Terror Project with their program MH First, a mobile mental health first responder team comprised of mental health professionals, doctors, nurses, peers, and community members. The MH First team disrupts the need for law enforcement in response to mental health crises by giving non-punitive and life-affirming interventions through de-escalation assistance. And these are just a few existing examples of abolition medicine in action. In her introduction to Mariam Kaba's new book, We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist Organizing and Transformative Justice, Naomi Murakawa says that Mariam Kaba's work is a portal connecting us to living currents of abolitionist organizing. What would it mean for us to take medicine through that portal and towards new possibilities? Abolition medicine means challenging race-based diagnostic tools and treatment guidelines that reinforce antiquated and scientifically inaccurate notions of biological race, like race correction in EGFR reporting, which perpetuate health disparities in access and quality of care. In words of legal scholar Dorothy Roberts, the way doctors practice medicine continues to promote a false and toxic view of humanity. There's a failure of imagination when it comes to race. What would it happen if doctors stopped treating patients by race? Suppose they rejected an 18th century classification system and incorporated instead the most advanced knowledge of human genetic diversity and unity that human beings cannot be classified into biological races. What if instead of using race as a crude proxy for a more important factor like SES, doctors actually investigated and addressed that important factor? Race medicine is bad medicine, it's poor science, and it's a false interpretation of humanity. Abolition medicine means integrating longitudinal anti-racist training into medical education, including the history of racism in medicine and structural factors that produce and perpetuate health disparities while actively recruiting, retaining, and supporting Black and other minoritized faculty, staff, and students. In fact, Dr. David Tweedy, who I also saw join this talk, um, so I don't mean to call him out, but a, psychi a psychiatrist and writer at Duke, uh, wrote about and discussed some of these issues at the same Grand Rounds talk last September. Supporting institutional efforts that provide reparations to communities of color devastated by unethical medical experimentation is another instrument of social change for abolition medicine. So for example, the class action lawsuit that ultimately awarded monetary restitution and a lifetime of free medical care to some of the families involved in the Tuskegee study. Or here in North Carolina, how in 2010, the state opened the Office of Justice for Sterilization Victims, which, we be, which began looking into the history and reparations for victims of forced sterilization. Practicing abolition medicine entails healthcare workers joining national conversations about police abolition and using their social power to divest from policing structures and reinvest in programs like MH First, which Zara just talked about, that build community capacity for mental health care, youth development, education, and employment, as well as harm reduction efforts around substance use, housing insecurity, and incarceration. Abolition medicine then means supporting, listening, and championing student-led initiatives like this one, Future Doctors in Politics, an organization founded by Harvard Medical students this past January 2021 that empowers future doctors to take an active role in political discourse and drive socially just and equitable policymaking as parts of their future career. Abolition medicine means supporting emerging movements around the country, like the Bay Area's Freedom Community Clinic and Vanderbilt's Educational Garden Initiative, which provides fresh food to Nashville's community of patients that visit Vanderbilt's student-run health clinic. Abolition medicine also means creating spaces for students and young professionals to engage in critical discussions to envision structural change. Um, so this one is a program at UC San Diego. It's their Coalition for Abolition Medicine, a student-run activist organization co-founded by trans and queer people of color um, just after our paper came out, or our very own Scientani's course on abolition medicine um, at Columbia, which tackles issues of medical racism and anti-racism. 
It also means encouraging and institutionally supporting efforts right here at UNC, like the Student Health Action Clinic, or SHAC, which provides care to underserved local communities, and the choice to introduce Harriet Washington's medical apartheid to all incoming medical students as a necessary fixture of the curriculum. It means continuing the existing efforts which weave social justice and medicine for both students and faculty, such as Dr. William Sturkey's lectures on the history of race in the American South, and more robustly integrating social and health systems or SHS curricula longitudinally. These discussions are not tangential or supplementary to medicine. They are the history, present, and future of the institution itself. If the emphasis of medicine is to first do no harm, then we must move health practices away from punitive models and violent systems and towards something more transformative. We see all of us as necessary leaders in the movement for an abolition medicine and nurturing that vision and building those alternative practices is everyone's job. The question of what a public health approach to public safety looks like continues to be an act of radical imagination. But at one point in US history, extraordinary but necessary systemic overhauls like the abolition of slavery too felt like the impossible. Both medical progress and racial justice are ultimately acts of speculation until they are actualized. By imagining and then working toward new cures or technologies to address diseases, medicine itself is always committing acts of speculation. So by imagining ourselves into a more racially just future invested in enriching communities, abolitionist physicians and nurses can work toward a future of health and social justice. Narrative medicine gives us the tools to see how a phenomenon like militarized metaphors in healthcare obscure structural context by making unclear who we serve and who we protect. Healthcare workers are not instruments of the state. Our duty is to heal communities in need and critique those systems that allow minoritized communities to be disproportionately harmed while rebuilding those systems in healthier ways. There are no prescriptions or shortcuts because as Murakawa reminds us, there are no life hacks to revolution. Abolition requires dismantling the oppressive systems that live out there and within us. Abolition medicine then is a practice of inward and outward speculation, of dreaming of a more racially just future and acting to bring that vision to fruition. It's asking ourselves, what is the healing work we aspire to? As anti-Asian hate crimes rise, including the horrific murders in Atlanta, and vaccine rationing continues to prioritize certain communities over others, incarcerated populations continue to lack adequate COVID protections. And as we continue to think about how we can build a healthier, more equitable future in the wake of this pandemic, the work of abolition medicine is as crucial as ever. It is not good enough for us to consider abolitionist practices and discuss or think about structural change only when national headlines grab our attention. We ask ourselves and all of you, colleagues and future leaders in medicine, who do you serve? Who do you protect? And so with that, we'll share with you only a few of our references. Um, and invite you all to ask any questions. And in fact, um, we thought we'd suggest to reverse traditional power dynamics in the room. Um, we'd like, I don't know if there's a concrete way to do this, but we'd like to prioritize first student questions, um, maybe especially those from UNC students, but certainly from any students who are attending. We'd love to prioritize your questions first. And perhaps to help us identify who those are, you're welcome to add maybe student to the, <laughs> the beginning or end of your question. But it looks like the first question in the chat um, is from a, a current UNC medical student. So Megan, I'll let you um, read the question. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that talk. Our first question is from Sahana who asks, how do you see federal policy playing a role in abolition medicine? 
Do either of you want to take that, Sarah or Yoshiko? Or actually, maybe I'll ask, um, was it Sahana? Sahana, to maybe, you know, um, to think about that question with us. How do you see it? Because I think that, and the reason I turn it around is not to put you on the spot at all, but rather to gesture to the fact that we're doing this work together, right? We're here today to think together and build something together, to generate together. Um, we're not here as holders of any particular answer. So we'd love to have a robust discussion you know, with all of you, envisioning all of you as kind of co-creators of this um, hopeful and critical and necessary future. So Sahana, do you mind if we put you on the spot and, and say how you um, envision the answer to your question? Sure, I don't mind. Um, I think, obviously, I know this was a very broad question. I was hoping to hear from you guys as experts on this, but um, I can see it obviously playing a really large role um, in abolition medicine, especially with um, big changes in the criminal justice system that are necessary, and especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and seeing how um, race and SES and all the other factors kind of play a role in how the pandemic played out in affecting marginalized populations. Um, so I was just kind of also thinking as a second part to my question, which I didn't really type out, um, with this like recent change in administration, how do you all see like an ideal policy kind of um, making abolition medicine a priority? Yoshiko, I don't know if you want to speak to this new organization um, that from January 2021. Yeah. And the role um, of kind of healthcare folks in policymaking and politics. Yeah, I think, I mean, I definitely think like one of, well, thank you so much for sharing that, Sahana. Um, she's one of my wonderful classmates um, in my SHS course. Um, I, I think that, so like, I, I think bringing doctors into these spaces who have expertise in public health and in mental health care, I think is, I mean, a start. So I think for instance, the program um, Doctors in Politics or Future Doctors in Politics is like one way I think that we see sort of young people being trained with particular skills to enter a room and to like share ideas with politicians and to pitch and propose. Um, and to like actually be engaged in a conversation longitudinally as a medical student and then as a resident and then hopefully as a future doctor thinking about how like you can actually integrate this as part of your work as a practicing clinician or you know scholar in in medicine. Um, so I mean I think that's like one specific example that that I do really like I think like MH first is a phenomenal example of the ways that like that funding can be divested from military sort of structures and move towards instead of, you know, policing and criminalizing in most cases what we see with mental health care and crises, um, like, you know, funding, for instance, programs like MH First which is, you know, founded and brought together by a group of physicians and public health activists. Um, I think that's another sort of so maybe perhaps more smaller first step um, that we could also see. Um, yeah. Um, Yoshiko, just to add to your point, I would say that, you know, if we're thinking about it, um, you know, in, in, in bigger scales regarding bills that enter, you know, Congress, Sahana, there's one um, that, you know, we can keep on our radar too, and, and others that I hope will, will continue to emerge, the Federal Death Penalty Abolition Act of 2021. That's something, you know, for us to think about. How does abolishing the death penalty, you know, under federal law, how does that become an abolition medicine issue? How does that factor into the work that we do um, and supporting similar movements like that? Um, I think is also part of our job, right? I think I might just for the purposes of everyone being able to see one another stop screen sharing, but there is, I do have something in my pocket that I'd love to share with you all later. Um, so I'll, I'll stop screen sharing. So perhaps we can have a bit more of a robust conversation by seeing one another. Um, hi, this is Kathleen Frazier. I'm wondering if I can pipe up. Uh, hello, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, that was an amazing talk and I, I just was uh, wanted to piggyback on this last part of the discussion in that it made me think of uh, hearing Angela Davis talk about reparations 
um, and this ties into policy and uh, healthcare abolitionist medicine in that um, she said, uh, how about we stop putting children in jail? Indeed, thank you, Kathleen. I don't, I don't know if I would ever want to, you know, speak after Angela Davis, but I think that that, right, that says it all. Um, certainly, as a pediatrician, um, I resonate deeply with that. Um, do we want to go um, back to the chat? Were there other students who had posted things earlier? Um, we do have another question from an undergrad here at UNC. Um, Karina says, thanks so much for this amazing presentation. I was wondering if there are ways to actualize abolition medicine as undergrads at UNC. So, um, we, actually, will you just repeat the question one more time? Because I'd love to, I'd love to um, hear that last bit. Great. She asks, um, if there are ways to actualize abolition medicine as undergrads at UNC. Um, I mean, I think that um, there are several ways. Um, I'd love to maybe punch to Zara and Yoshiki to talk about other kind of concrete organizing ways, because at the end, what I'd like to do is um, show you something that my undergraduate students at Columbia are doing in a seminar called Abolition Medicine, inspired by this particular essay. But maybe I'll, I'll point to other organizing and policy, you know, um, thoughts to that notion of what undergrads can do. And then I'll show you um, the thing that I've been wanting to show you from my undergraduate students. <laughs> sure. Um, Sayantani, thank you for that. Um, I will just share a few words about how we can build our knowledge base first. And then maybe I'll, I'll punt it over to Yoshiko to maybe share some of the things that are happening around the country or, or you know, at UNC specifically. Um, you know, one of the things that has been really helpful for me um, and some of my friends has been abolition book clubs. And that's something that, you, you know, you can do with your friends, you can do it with your siblings, um, you can join ones that already exist. Um, one of my uh, very dear friends uh, who's at uh, Creighton right now for med school, she started an abolition medicine book club a year ago and it has since gained so much traction and people are kind of calling in in her sessions from all over. There are virtual book clubs, um, you know, that you might be, uh, you might want to consider joining that um, extend beyond abolition specifically as a theme. Uh, one of my favorite digital um, book club spaces is called hashtag because we've read. I'll drop the link in the chat, um, but it has a robust digital library. You can join a local chapter um, you know, near you. You can start one near you. Um, you can join live discussions. And I think that those are really great ways of, of holding us accountable to be participating in community work, really doing it, and um, and really uh, committing ourselves, you know, really committing ourselves to practicing, learning, growing together. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind as a way to to start to actualize it is to create those community um, oriented reading groups together. Yeah, and I think um, I think. Uh... Oh, Dr. Saunders um, also just contributed some other organizations like at at um, UNC as well. But I think, I, I mean, I think you know, finding organizations that are doing this like this grassroots sort of level work within your local community and trying to find a way to physically get involved is like, you know, one one way to to sort of experience it and be a part of something um, that you necessarily, if you can't, you know, found something um, in addition to, I think, you know, these sort of um, more abstract ways of engaging with like the information itself. Um, I was just thinking about like the UNC has, you know, like a phenomenal fit program, which is the formerly incarcerated um, and I think transitions program, and it's um, a program that UNC is led by Dr. Evan Ashkin, um, and they do incredible um, community and also sort of, um, you know, working with um, larger hospital systems, as well as sort of helping people from like the post release into transition and I think um, getting involved with organizations that are already doing this work um, within your you know your structures and supporting that and um yeah whether that's you know encouraging other students or yourself or um you know wherever you go off next doing something similar whatever that might be i think those are all great ways 
Um, so I have um, a group of mostly undergraduates, some graduate students in a seminar called Abolition Medicine, in which we're pursuing very similar um, kind of notions as we discussed in this talk, um, really looking at healthcare systems and what their responsibilities are to a broader kind of abolition ethos. Um, toward that end, my final project for this class was, as I envisioned it, a, some kind of public facing essay or op-ed that I was asking my students to write on a health justice, either a, you know, an issue of medical racism that they wanted to tackle and point out or a, a kind of methodology of medical anti-racism that they wanted to lift up. And my students said to me, well, you know, Dr. Dasgupta Sayantani, if you really care about access, why are you asking us to write op-eds for the New York Times? Um, what if we do health justice TikToks? And I said, look, right, this is the moment where you're like, of course you should do health justice TikToks. Like, of course that's the right answer because we're, we're not just talking about content and material, we're also thinking through how the process reflects the message, right? And who it's accessible to. So I just wanted to share with you with permission from this student, one health justice TikTok that looks at a public health campaign and does a really quick but accessible anti-racist analysis on and um, kind of disability studies analysis of this public health campaign. It is but one example of a bunch of accessible um, health justice TikToks that my students are currently putting out into the world. And I'm so terribly proud of them. Um, so let's see, let me just share my screen and then I'll share my sound as well. Share my computer sound. Okay. Can everyone see that? Will someone just let me know if you can see this? Okay. Okay, hey, so today I wanted to talk to you guys about how public health ads and health ads in general can be just as racist, ableist, and sneaky with their marketing techniques as any other private company. So today I wanted to start with this example of a 2012 ad from the Bloomberg administration, essentially trying to encourage people to drink smaller portions of soda to help with their diabetes management. But let's take a look at how they made this ad. So here we have this person who is in all black and white, meant to look super miserable and with an amputation. And basically what this ad is implying is that they had to get an amputation because they drank large amounts of soda and made their diabetes worse. The controversial part about this ad is that they photoshopped out the model's leg. Here's the original photo that they got from a stock image website. This model wasn't even confirmed to have diabetes, but the health department edited the amputation in. So beyond calling this ad out because lying is bad, I really wanted to talk about the narrative it's creating about race and disability and diabetes. So the fact that the health department intentionally edited an amputation in shows that they're using disability as a marketing tool. To understand why using disability as a marketing tool in this instance actually works for what they're trying to accomplish, Leonard Davis, who's a super prominent disability scholar, explains that we have narratives about normativity and disability in our popular culture that reinforce the idea that people with disabilities are inherently morally flawed or inferior. Since this ad is all about drinking soda or supposed to be, it's really important for them to create that narrative. Because what this ad is basically saying is that people like this model, aka black people with diabetes, aren't able to make the right choices and therefore suffer poor health consequences. Even though we know that there's much more that goes into drinking soda and soda consumption, this ad basically blames black disabled people for it. So of course, lying for lying's sake is bad. But the fact that the New York Health Department went out of their way to fake a disability in their ad shows that they're actively enforcing this idea that black people's personal choices are part of a pathology and that disability is a marker for poor decision making. And this is especially important for people to know and talk about with diabetes because so many people with this illness think that it's their fault that they're sick and they should have been able to control it. That's what this ad wants you to think so they can continue to blame racialized groups for their poor health outcomes instead of literally anything else. So hopefully you guys found this really quick analysis helpful and I'd love to hear anything that you guys are thinking in the comments. <laughs>
food availability and, uh, you know, et cetera. There's a broader analysis that uh, she's going to go into later um, in a different context, but super accessible to one minute TikToks back to back, right? Um, and so there, there's a group of students going to put a bunch of these into the world. So what can undergraduates do? Certainly, you know, do amazing critical analysis in accessible ways and put them out there in the world. One suggestion. Um, how, how are we doing for time, Dr. Weed? Yeah, so we're right at that 60 minute mark. If you're okay to go another few minutes, we can, um, we can aim to, to keep it under 75 minutes, but uh, certainly honoring anyone's time if, you, if you'd like to or need to hop off, please do so. I have a quick question, if I may. I'm also a first year medical student here at UNC. First of all, thank you so much for this powerful uh, talk. It's, it's quite incredible. I'm looking forward to seeing the recording because <laughs> there's a lot of notes I wanna make. Um, so I kind of had two questions. One of them is, uh, uh, Dr. Dasgupta, I know there was a um, class that was mentioned or reference that you teach and I was wondering how students who may not be at Columbia could access those resources or perhaps even the class if um, they were interested in or like, will you have to absolutely be a student enrolled at Columbia to um, to learn more about about this and, and how we can do what else we could do moving forward. The other question, I know we talked about the militarized um, rhetoric and language used right now for healthcare workers during the pandemic and the pandemic. And um, I was wondering um, what can we do about that? Obviously, perhaps stop using that language, but. Um, I don't know if there were any alternative alternatives or solutions that were offered uh, in the talks. Maybe they were, I kind of missed them. I can answer your first question really quickly. I can share some information with Dr. Reed about the course itself. Um, it's a brand new course that literally, I mean, we wrote this essay and then I, you know, um, I was asked by um, the Center for Ethnicity and Race to float a medical racisms course. And I, was very honest and I was like, you know what, right now, it, you know, this was last summer, I was like, I don't think I can teach medical racisms without teaching medical anti-racisms for entire summer. I don't think my heart can take it. I have to teach the solutions. Um, and so that's how that course came about. It is right now, it's a brand new course only offered at Columbia, but certainly look at, um, you know, that the um, UC San Diego, did I say that right? UC San Diego, um, uh, kind of student run community course there, there are, um, similar kind of thinking spaces and courses popping up all over the place, which is which is the point, right? Which is wonderful. Um, alternatives, does somebody else wanna take the thought on alternatives to militarized language? I mean, to me, I think the militarized language are like the symptom of the broader kind of cultural, you know, issue, right? Um, we can take away the language, but I think we also have to think about like why it's there and what it is that we're invoking when we use it. Right, and when we lean so hard into it, I mean, I went to medical school a very long time ago, and I'll still poke medical students to be like, "Y'all still call each other gunners? Is that a thing that's still happening?" And they're like, "Yep, still happening, <laughs> you know, alive and well." Um, do you all want to take that that point or question? Or I mean, Saitani, the only thing I would add, um, Kenny, thank you for for your question. Um, the only thing that I would add is is we give language meaning, right? So if we can, if we can reduce the meaning that we attribute to military, you know, military rhetoric, um, then that might be one of the ways that we can kind of make this happen, right? Is like if we if we reduce the frequency that we use that language, and we also reduce the meaning that we attribute to that language, we might be able to move towards more peaceful metaphors or or different kinds of language to describe our healthcare workers and 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 you know, things like that. So that's sort of where maybe I think we may be able to head. I actually had another quick question, if I may go quickly. Um, yeah, so I'm interested, I'm a junior undergrad at UNC, and I'm just really interested in how um, narrative medicine is practiced, like actually within the clinical encounter, just because like, I feel like the tension between the like the hierarchies of knowing, especially in that um, situation, and I'm just wondering like the challenges that you face and how you all navigate it. I guess I mean just for a, so a couple examples. Um, so I think I think like fundamentally, I think narrative medicine is like a way of 
um, sort of decoupling or trying to like um, break break down like your preconceived ideas about an other or like the totalizing notion of the the knowable other and I think there are like all these ways that you know in a one-to-one -one setting I think having this kind of understanding within that is largely grounded in literature and like the ways that you know narratives teach us and show us like through different forms of storytelling um the ways that we understand each other interact with each other communicate with with each other I think those are things that you know, will influence the patient clinician or the yet yeah, the patient and physician encounter itself. So I think I, I would hope that, you know, as anybody who sort of interacts and grapples with this material, like it will sort of infuse, you know, the personal work that you do, I think it, in some sort of other ways, um, or like large, broader ways, um, there are lots of sort of, there is a form of the narrative medicine workshop that is a particular um, kind of health humanities sort of um, structured session, which, um, you know, now has been offered at hospitals and medical schools all over the, the country and the world. Um, my, my friend and I are actually doing a series at UNC on anti-racism um, this, this year. Um, and I think those are also, those are like very particular spaces where we sort of do the work of engaging with stories or with, with visual and other art creative materials as a way of sort of trying to decouple and like engage with these questions about um, the like the phenomenological other and in the in myself. Um, so I think like those workshops are sort of specific ways that you might, you know, see them in your journey through medicine or um, just I think in academia or health, the health humanities in general. Um, and again, I think, I mean, but much more broadly, I think it's um, a lot of it is sort of trying to understand constantly, um, you know, with things like structural competency, like how the, how like the patient physician, um, like narrative is placed within larger structural narratives and how medicine is always sort of placed within larger societal and structural institutional narratives. I think that is like the larger sort of question that um, by I think using a sort of narrative medicine lens or, or whatever you might want to call it, I think sort of allows for that constant reckoning and that constant, I think, sort of thinking. And I think that's probably fundamentally like the most important thing that at least I've gained from it and that I've sort of continued to, to think about in my my day to day as, as a med student and certainly hope to do in the future. I don't know, San Antonio, like I'm sure there are many, many other ways in which narrative medicine is actualized. No, I think that was a rather brilliant, uh, rather brilliant uh, summary and a great question indeed from, from a great question. Um, I just want to be, you know, cognizant of our time and make sure. Yeah, it looks like we have another student question in the chat. I know Megan was going to read, but it, so it looks like her internet's not going so well. So um, this is from Noah. Um, and Noah, I'll go ahead and ask, are you, would you like to pose the question yourself since we're, we're moved to this kind of Q&A or would you prefer I read it? I can read the question, yeah. Great. So my question is, I can just read what I sent in the chat, but it says kind of piggy, piggybacking off of, of my bad. I'm on two screens, that's why I can hear myself. Okay. So my question is kind of piggybacking off of Dr. Tweedy's message in the chat, but do you think community-based initiatives like MH First are the brightest hope to curbing racist health outcomes since there is usually a pushback on, on abolition medicine in a lot of spaces? I believe that federal legislation can have amazing benefits and there are certainly signs of abolition like Virginia abolishing the death penalty last week, but these changes can take years to incorporate and racist health practices are taking lives every day. In the past year, with an increased spotlight on anti-Black and anti-Asian racism, a lot of minorities have adopted the mindset of, we keep us safe, since America has never done it for us. Of course, it is also very true that policy has power. Yeah, absolutely. Zara, do you want to address this? I mean, this is a really quick thing I'll say is both um, you know, uh, both uh, this beautiful new book and the, you know, years of work of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, you know, points us to the fact that we have to work in all the places all the time. Like this work is 
Um, it's multifactorial. It's all of us doing the work. It's the policy, it's the community level work. It's us taking care of us. It's us demanding changes in policy. We have to do all the work all the time. Um, and I think the important thing that, you know, Ruthie Gilmore reminds us is that it's, and, and uh, Mary McCopper reminds us and Angela Davis reminds us is that it's generative work, it's hopeful work. You know, we're critiquing and breaking down systems, but we're creating new and better ones, you know, simultaneously, I hope. And that's the hope, um, right? That's the generative framework. But yeah, it's, we, it's all the work. <laughs> it's all the work in all those spaces. Zara, do you, um, do you wanna? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, no, that's a really great question. Um, and I think it speaks to just uh, the core of, of what happens next, right? And uh, I, think it, um, I think it speaks to something that Kimberly Crenshaw um, mentioned recently. She was talking about intersectional vulnerability, right? How do we address intersectional vulnerability when people are vulnerable across multiple, um, uh, across multiple means? And, uh, I think, like you said, uh, and, and this is something that comes up in our, you know, in, in the presentation too, is that you know we 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 know that uh, police and prisons don't fundamentally keep our communities safe, right? They 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 keep some people safe, but often at the expense of of Black people, Indigenous people, queer and trans people of color, and so um, you know we hope that abolition medicine um, does does the work of of placing abolition, which is already an existing framework and already existing movement, places that in, in tandem with medicine to help us see how we can create collective healthier systems um, that move beyond punitive measures, right? Um, and uh, beyond systems that reproduce harm. And so I think that that pushes us to think about reinvesting in supporting resources around mutual aid. Like mutual aid um, networks have really grown, I mean, drastically, especially so over the past year um, because of people's very real needs, um, you know, and, 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 and needing to meet those needs and communities standing up for one another um, and, uh, and helping one another. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, we, we kind of have to look at all of these things, working on them in, in tandem. A lot of it is longitudinal work. And then there's also immediate work that we can do now, like joining mutual aid networks around us, um, you know, in the community that you're in. I'm sure there are some near UNC in and around the area. Um, and maybe you're already tapped into some, you know? So I think that that's, um, that's part of the real actual work that we can be doing is, is plugging into mutual aid networks that are near us and figuring out how we can build our community um, and collective capacities around stronger, safer uh, communal care networks and programs that prioritize um, communal health justice. Well, I just have to thank you for being so generous with your time with us today. Um, just a quick note. Oh yes, we should all give um, our speakers a round of applause for this incredibly generative and exciting talk. Um, I will be saving the chat and compiling some of the resources that you've all mentioned, and I will make sure that they are part of uh, the blog write-up that Noah will be doing about this talk so that that's available more publicly. Um, so keep an eye out for that. We will be doing this series again next year in some capacity. We hope to be able to keep a virtual component. So if you'd like to join our mailing list and find out more about what's coming next, please feel free to add your name and email to the chat before you log off and I'll make sure you get added to that. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I hope you all have a great evening.